We're dancing, by the way. You can't see us. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Brian. I'm Theo. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. I love that delay in audio. <laughs> <laughs> it happens sometimes. Yeah. And today's topic is things you did as a child. Mm. Little tiny child. Child being before the age of majority. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that, I, that actually reminds me now that we were talking about this on a previous podcast where, um, like, when you things you did before you were an adult or something like that and I had a hard time trying to figure out what it was because like of the protracted youth and yep. everything like that so that's kind of funny yeah before before you turn 20 pretty mm-hmm. much um, so the icebreaker is the fa- what is your favorite place or trip you went on as a kid like camps or vacations or things like that Theo, we made you go first last time, so I'll make Hot go first this time because he's drinking water. Sounds good. Um, so, ah, wipe the water off my mustache. My favorite... For listeners, Huck has a mustache. I do have a mustache. I am uh, ruggedly handsome with a beard and mustache. I wear glasses. I have a fairly light complexion, but it goes red because I have a very vascular system. You like long walks on the beach? Long walks on the beach. I have dark <laughs> hair that's currently styled with gel left over from yesterday because I'm a mm. dirty bastard. I never shower. <laughs> but I put on enough deodorant that uh, it doesn't bother Jim in the slightest. So what you're saying is that Huck is already... You're, you're like a child now. Yes. <laughs> And we are too far into the podcast for us to restart, so let's continue on with this tan or break this tangent and continue on with the podcast. So, <laughs> my favorite trip that I, I ever you. went on, uh, I was in Army Cadets, and we'll probably cycle back to that a little bit later on in the podcast, but um, I went to a series of summer camps, and the year of 2000, or I should say the summer of 2005, I want to say, I think it was before I started university. God, you're so I know. Um, I went on an outward bound course. Uh, it was actually a leadership and challenge course was, was how they classified it. And it was uh, the old Banff course, but they got relocated to the Rocky Mountain National Army Cadet Summer Training Center, which was outside of Canmore, Alberta, I believe. So I was in Alberta for six weeks, um, and each of the weeks we did a number of um, mountain-based activities. So it was one week of mountain biking, one week of a glacier assault, uh, one week of whitewater kayaking, one week of rock climbing, like rock face climbing, uh, and one week of hiking. And then the final week was a leadership week where we did you know leadership activities, group activities. Uh, so yeah, six weeks of awesome. Uh, I nearly drowned. Um, I had a very hard time climbing rocks as a as a large kid. <laughs> uh, I lost a, a hell of a lot of weight on that trip. Hmm. Um, I failed my first mountain challenge. Uh, I learned a lot about myself. You know, you love, you lo- lose, and I learned how to avoid biking through cow patties because the the. The, rock, the training center was adjacent to a bunch of like mountain f- ranches and whatnot, and there were just cows everywhere, and there was just cow shit everywhere. So it was amazing. Yeah, cow shit everywhere sounds pretty awesome. Totes. Sounds like sounds like Cooper. <laughs> sounds like <laughs> I can't wait to go to Scotland. <laughs> Theo, how about you? You mentioned some sort of creepy amusement park. You laugh when I said this. I will laugh again. I've, I've just I've just worked out why I remember this holiday so much. Um, I was about six or seven. We went to this place called Flamingo Land which is like a sort of holiday park. We, we took a caravan. We did a, a touring caravan. And the holiday park was attached to this little, little theme park. It was kind of I think now it's more bigger rides, but the rides at the time were all kind of geared towards kids, like those little tiny like little caterpillar roller coasters and things. And it was all little rides that kids could go on. And once you're in the park, you kind of had free reign to go in the amusement park. So we spent our days in there, and at night you went to the little cop house, and there was like shows on and like magic shows and stuff. And I think the reason this one stands out to me so much is the fact, not the fact that like I could finally, I was finally big enough to go on all the rides without my mom having to be there. That's the summer I learned to ride a bike. Because my dad had for weeks, in fact probably months, kept taking me to the beach nearby and making me cycle along the tide line. The idea being I fell off, I got wet, so don't fall off. 
and I was Fair. really bad at it. I was, I was really bad at it because he kept yelling at me for falling off. So I got really scared, and I, for me, like riding a bike was just a thing I was absolutely terrified of. Mm-hmm. And like we went to this, went to the the caravan place, and my mom's like, "We'll take the bikes because you might want to cycle about." And I was like, "Yeah, whatever. I'm going to need my bike." But while they were setting up the yawning stuff on the caravan and weren't paying attention to me, I was like, "I'm going to try this bike thing. Cause I think I can do it." And I managed to do it because my dad wasn't yelling at me for five minutes. <laughs> so basically, like, I, I made myself over this fear of riding my bike that summer, and I, I, my, my, there's pictures of me and my sister, like, cycling around the park and stuff. So I think that's why, because it's kind of like I, I, I overcame this big challenge I kind of had, and it was a really cool place to go on holiday. Neat. So that was one Very of cool. It's amazing what happens when you don't have somebody yelling at you and putting yeah, pressure well, on you. Not making you So the guy whose favorite like, holiday was, yeah, was going like, to a six-week army cadet camp. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I'm like, I wasn't riding along a tide line falling in the sea every time I fell off my bike. It was nice. At least it wasn't a uh, trial by fire, literally, where you're <laughs> yeah, bi- well. biking along, I don't know, a, a volcano or something like that. I've don't spread these Legos along the edge of the driveway. Oh, don't okay. fall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yimmy. Oh, yeah, me. Uh, so I, when I was about seven or eight, um, I was involved in Big Brothers. Specifically, I was a little brother. And Big Brothers is, uh, for those who don't know, there's an organization for uh, boys without fathers. They, they, you know, so people who are kids who have who are part of a single parent family. They have a sister organization, which is Big Sisters, and they have their own summer camp. And I went. It was called Camp McGovern, and it was easily the most transformative experience of my childhood. Uh, and I would go to that camp every year, sometimes twice a year uh, from like age 8 or 9 until age 14 like no no question, I was there were, there was going to be times in the summer when I was when I was gone to Cam McGovern and it was a huge part of my life um, because it was a camp f- entirely for kids who were part of Big Brothers so every guy I met there was from a single parent family like mine I mean not always exactly like mine different socioeconomic class different um, you know sort of intersections of all kinds of things uh, some of them were um, like guys whose, whose dad had died um, or whose parents had split up but they still knew their dads but as a kid who was basically like everybody I knew had two parents it was really cool to go to a camp where everybody was kind of like me. And we knew, like, you have that moment at summer camp where you're sitting around with a bunch of people and you have no idea. Like, when you first meet them, especially when you're a kid and you don't know how to meet people, especially if you're an introvert like me, <laughs> you're you're just like, well, we don't really have anything in common and, and et cetera. And your counselors usually try and see that. They do mixer games and things like that. But there, we all knew we had one thing in common. And it helped us get past a lot of that sort of weird awkwardness and form some neat friendships. That would last for a week. And then you would promise to write to each other because that was before there was an internet. And then you never would. Because you were children. (laughs) But it was a it was a super good time. Like we did all kinds of leadership activities. We went into crevices. We did all kinds of things. I recall getting super scared sometimes, and um, it was the place where it introduced me to things like archery and canoeing and all kinds of outdoor stuff. I learned how to win at hide and seek. Be you just have to be very quiet. Hide in obvious places. Be very quiet. I know being very quiet does not seem like it's part of my skill set. <laughs> But let me tell you, I hide like a motherfucker. Now I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm not fucking Batman. No, I'm just in my like hiding behind things and jumping out at me. I'm very. It's very easy to scare the shit out of me. No, 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 no. Like in the context of hide and seek, I my favorite memory is is always when I was uh, when I was a, I was a counselor in training there in my last year, and. My hiding place was I was just laying in a bush 
like right next to the home base, completely still. Like there, were, the home base was like three feet from me. There were kids who were hunting me, sitting at it chatting, and I could hear them. <laughs> and it lasted until some kid chucked a rock into the bushes. It landed like a foot from my head. And the counselor who was watching home base and, and sort of overseeing everything was like, don't chuck rocks into the bushes. And they're like, why not? He's like, there could be somebody hiding in there. And I'm like, crap. And I start rolling down the hill as the kids run into the bush. <laughs> <laughs> I was so mad that they blew my hiding spot, but it was such a good spot. It's amazing. But yeah, so I mean, summer camps and, and you know, army cadets and things like that are kind of what kinds of things were you involved in as a child? Like, everybody goes to activities because you don't have a job. Unless you do have a job. Mm -hmm. I had a job until I was 13. I had time for them. <laughs> I didn't have a real job until I was like 18. Yeah, I think my first job was, it was two weeks, but it was like when I was 12 or 13. Between grade 8 and grade 9. Mm. Whatever that was. Yeah, I had a couple of those. Corn to tasseling. Ooh. Um, so Theo, what kind of stuff were you involved in as a kid? Um, the biggest Indian thing I got Scotland. involved in as a kid was actually the brownies. I was super into the brownies, like, oh, it was ridiculous levels. Um, no. I have, I still have two best brownie trophies I got. It was summer and autumn, 1997. I remember the dates, since we talked about it earlier on. So, so I went to high school with some people who were, quote, super into the brownies, uh, they were stoners. <laughs> thanks! Eight-year-old me, thank what, you for What that. I'm asking is, when you say you're super into the brownies, you know are what you I referring like? to dank nugs? No. No. I was eight. <laughs> Behave. The Hootie Mac. The no, I mean, like... You know, like, when you, like it's, it's obviously, like, Brownies is, like, a, a younger set of the Girl Guide movement. And it's always, you know, when you go to things like that, it's always this kid who has, like, all the badges and wins all the inspections and super, yeah, but that was me. I'm familiar like, with that kid I, and their lunch money. Yeah, like, our uniform at the time, it has changed since then. At the time, was you, you had a sash to put your, like, your badges on as you, like, got your badges for different activities. I had two sashes. I had so many badges. Um... I was a sixer. Our six was the Kelpies. I still remember that. I was leader of the Kelpies. We were third Cooper. I still even remember the name of the pack. Um, like I got to help with like people doing their promises and doing like color party and stuff. Um, when we did like the gala, it was my dad's lore we used for the float. We went on camp. My mom was the cook because I was so into it. Yeah. Um, no, Brownies was a huge part of my life for a long, long time. I, I went to the guides afterwards as well, but like the Brownies was the one I spent what time working on mm -hmm. like I can still even remember projects and stuff I did for badges and that is, that's how into it I was it, like how, like 19 years later I can still remember the stuff I did wow um, but I like, the, the, one of the cool things as well like so I went to and went into guides and just after I went to the guides we went to um, Pat's Lodge which is like the guide the world guiding house in London and there was a thing on one of the tables for pen pals, and I put my note in the thing for the pen pal. I still talk to my pen pal this day. It's 16 wow. years later, and we still talk to each other. Um, she lives in, she's in Las Vegas now. She was living in London at the time, and her dad was um, in the Air Force, so she moved about a bit. But she's in Las Vegas now, and we still talk. So, like, yeah, like that whole, like, the guide movement, and that was a massive part of me as a kid. And when I finished that, I went and played music seven days a week in every band I could come across. So I was, I was kind of as a kid. I was like a lot busier than I am now. It's a bit ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah, no. Even now, I get thinking about it. I just, I can. I don't even know what woman uniform I had. I can, I can see in my head. I can see pictures of me in my uniform. In fact, like I remember a couple of years ago. Um, I can't remember why. I had to go and see my old guide. I think my old guide leader is still a guide leader. Brian was still there. And I had to go see her for some reason. And um, when I got there, she sort of laughed, and she went to the cupboard where we used to keep our, our supplies, which was different groups in the hall. We had a cupboard each. 
Yeah. When she opened the cupboard, the door inside the door was just covered with pictures of stuff we did, and I was in about 90% of the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> because I was involved in every activity they did. So we will do you the favor of not digging up one of those pictures uh, to put no. as our feature image? I don't think I have any pictures. I don't think I have the pictures. But uh, So, Huck, you were also in Scouts? Yeah. Um, I went through the the boys' equivalent, so I did Beavers. Um, then I did Cubs, uh, and then I had uh, graduated from Cubs and was about to start Boy Scouts. <clears throat> uh, I, too, had a lot of badges. I didn't have two sashes, but maybe because I am normal size and, and Ted's Hobbit size might be a little different. I had, But my front and back of my sash were, were full of badges. Fuck all of you. I was tall um, for a kid. Okay, uh, that's fair. Um, I... And I, I do remember that badges, uh, a series of badges had been added midway through my Cubs career. So, and I know you're a couple years, a couple years younger than me. So I'm not sure um, if you had a, a similar kind of proliferation of badges. I think I finished with only missing four of the badges. I think I got almost all the rest of them at the time. Our one got um, changed after I left. Like I know, like they did a whole, mm-hmm. they, they did a whole, they changed the badges and they changed the uniforms. Mm-hmm. And they change the system through which you get your badges. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I think, should. Yeah. I have a sneaky suspicion my my mother still has mine, um, but I, I remember stumbling across a, a bunch of old Cub Scout books, and I, I don't know if they're mine or if it was just ones because I'm a book pack rat. But <laughs> so, anyways, uh, I, I have my name all over them. But yeah, oh. <laughs> they're definitely mine. Uh, uh, so then I, I, as I said, I graduated up into the Boy Scouts for Canada, but that was the time when my mom finished her nursing diploma and she got a job in the States. So we moved to the States and I did a year of Boy Scouts in the U.S. And then uh, after that, moved to Texas, didn't do anything. Then I moved back to Canada um, and I didn't join Army Cadets until a grade nine year of high school. I was a little late starting. I was a... Uh, about a year ahead of everybody in, in my, my class. Uh, so I joined Boy Scouts, or sorry, Boy Scouts, <laughs> Army Cadets. Uh, They're a little different. A little very different. Uh, I joined Army Cadets for five years because, yeah, I, I got my five year medal uh, when I, the year that I, I left, I aged out. Um, yeah, and I think, I think that covers my my kid years uh i was involved in a couple other things um the duke of edinburgh award program um edinburgh and edinburgh edinburgh so, edinburgh, edinburgh. <laughs> are you guys do talking you, about edinburgh do, do you edinburgh oh. <laughs> shots fired oh. uh so i was involved with that uh but the big heavy stuff of that came in my 20s um uh, I think I joined before I turned 20, but like the, my trip to Kenya was when I was 21 or 22. So well, doesn't count. Yeah, that, that that part of it doesn't count. But I joined when I was in, in army cadets, and you age out at age 19. Basically, as soon as you're old enough to drink in Ontario, you're done. <laughs> they kick you out. <laughs> you're old enough to join the real army then. Well, in, in, in our our core, um, our tradition is they buy us a beer stein, they a pewter beer stein. They engrave it with your information and whatnot, and then the bottom's a glass bottom, so it's always like bottomless kind of deal. Ah, so. It's yeah. We it's strange to think how much we encourage uh, consuming alcohol based on that token gesture. Yeah, there's what's a culture of drinking. Yeah, um, I think uh, yeah, I think those were the main things that I was involved in uh, activities, and I did a, a lot of other sports teams and stuff. You know, I was in swimming and whatnot. But we'll get down to like the games we played later on. Fair enough. Uh, my childhood, I also was in Beavers, and uh, I spent a year or so in Cubs. I had a total of like four badges. My my mom was a was a like a boss beaver leader and cub leader, um, which was good because that was what allowed us the sort of wherewithal to go. Otherwise, I couldn't we couldn't afford uniforms or anything like that. I wore a uniform from a cub museum the entire time I was there, and then I moved to Kitchener and I stopped doing all that because there was nothing in the area for me to do. Like it was here, but it was far enough away that. I would have had to go with an adult, and my mom was working non-stop nights. Mm -hmm. So there was no way that was going to happen. So, yeah, no, my involvement in stuff 
didn't it started with things like karate I studied uh, Weichiru karate for about seven years learned to break boards and not to uh, bust my head on stuff but you know I spent a bunch of time in school in drama drama was my jam until I was like 15 and that was my second I can't remember if it was my first or second time getting thrown out of high school uh, I want to say second. It was my second time getting thrown out of high school when I was like, I gotta get out of drama. Quote from Past Jim, there's no money in drama, says the guy who got two degrees in philosophy. <laughs> what I'm saying is Teenage Jim's an idiot. But and he was really self-conscious about it. Uh, I joined choirs my last couple of years in school because... The music teacher found me at school at 6 in the morning for some reason because I would come in that early because I was just weird and bored. And I'd get up early. And uh, that was when the choir would practice. And I would like sing along and wander around the halls. And he'd be like, join the fucking choir! <laughs> like, okay. And I did. And it was great. I joined every choir that school had. Um, as soon as I, that, I realized that singing was a thing I loved to do, I could do it in a choir. And then I would become self-conscious about it for the next ten years. Uh, no, the big thing for me, weirdly enough, and I didn't mention this in the pre-show. I, on purpose, didn't mention it. When I was about 15, 15, 16, 16, I started vampire LARPing. And... The people I met doing that are people I'm still friends with. Yeah, right? Right? <laughs> I'm just leaning off the, off the frame because he's embarrassed to be in here. Yeah, no, no when I, everyone, when I everyone still else... have friends I met LARPing. I still talk to. Yeah. When I... When I, I... Still... No, when I, when I was... When all my other classmates were out, like, getting... Or they were drinking underage and meeting girls and doing whatever else, uh, I and everyone I knew was down at the local university pretending to be vampires. I remember walking through that that space years later, like when I was about 27, uh, with a, a friend of mine who had just moved here from the United States. And we met up with uh, her boyfriend, who's, a, who's a, a good friend of mine from those days, and still is. And we looked at each other, and he's like, What the fuck were we thinking? Why did we ever think this was cool? And I don't have a good answer for him, and I didn't, I didn't then, and I don't now. But I do know that I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. These are the crew of people who, later in life, I would go on to run headshots with. Mm hmm um, these are the crew of people who later in life I work with them, I play with them, I hang out with them. You know, they are good people and I love them dearly. They are the kinds of people who you were stuck with them for the rest of your life and it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. But Arping vampire larping. I was an elf. That's, uh, no, no, ours was like vampire. Um, there was a werewolf game that ran, there was a very brief. Fey game. I ran a couple of LARP games. That's where I got in, like seriously into role playing. Mm -hmm. What and where I cut my teeth on it was I spent five years running games for like you know 25, 30 people, and then was like, you know what? I'm just going to run D and D. Mm -hmm. And, and we got did to that say, for like, we, know, 14 years. Like on a Saturday when we we're heading out, we'd always get the bus at the same time because we knew it was the same driver was on. He kind of got used to this bunch of weirdos getting on the bus dressed up <laughs> and getting off at the woods and wandering away. Yeah, but when you've got elves, like, you're like bus or larping, it. right? Yeah, he just didn't even question it. He's just like, okay, guys, mm. get on the bus, hurry up, come on. You know, <laughs> like, vampires, it's wall to wall, black trench coats, sunglasses, leather. Oh no, I had a cloak and everything. It's great. <laughs> No, it, it was a good time. I, like I said, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, and looking back on it is weirdly one of the most important, like, formative experiences that I have in the, my older childhood years. Um, so, one of the things we noticed during the pre-show, um, you may not have noticed, but Theo is from Scotland. Woo! 
And TV, especially for children, is super different when there's a whole ocean in between you. Which is weird because you can send TV signals across the ocean now. Right. But once upon a time, you could not. And during that fateful time, we were children. <laughs> so what did you watch as a kid? Uh, I was also going to make, make the slight note that there's enough of a gap between you and me that I watched the stuff I start remembering was like very 90s. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, like my, my favorite show, the one I always go back to when I was a kid, was just called Fireman Sam. And it was like the same idea as Postman Pat. As Postman Pat, he does his job. Fireman Sam is the same sort of models. And they were set in this fictional Welsh town called Ponty Pandy, which I think is based on Ponty Preet in the Rhondda Valley. Um, and yeah, it was just like, it was the town. It was this, I remember there was this kid called Norman who was always mm-hmm. getting in trouble because he was always trying to do stuff to look cool or to like get pocket money or something. And usually whatever he did ended up with the fire brigade having to come out because he caused that much trouble. Um, but I think the reason I kind of latched onto that one was because my dad has friends from near, near there, so they sounded like my dad's friends. And when I was very little, I was like, <laughs> I know people like that, and it kind of in my head, I was always like, yes, this is really cool. Um, yeah, Farm and Sam was a big one, and things like, if you guys know what Pingu is, yes, I know all of it. I know. I, yeah, I, know. I, I know me some. Pingu was a big thing in our house. Um, is that the Penguin Claymation? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if I watched it, but recently on the the social network, somebody mixed that no, with no. the thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a slip newt, which is always slip knot guys replaced with Pingu heads. Be great. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, Pingu was big, the dog, Thomas the Tank Engine. Like, we, there was a time recently my dad and I had a fight over the control one Saturday morning. Because I wanted to watch a cooking program, and he wanted to watch Thomas the Tank Engine. So, so in um, Britain, it's Thomas the Tank Engine, right? Yeah. Like, it's just like shorts of Thomas the Tank Engine with the narrator. Yeah, who was um, Ringo Starr. So, in Canada and America, because I remember that show, but that show is Shining Time Station. Mm-hmm. It's a half an hour program. There's there, and there's a like a subplot that runs through it with kids. Because the host of Shining Time Station, the conductor, was George Carlin. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then they used those Thomas the Tank Engine shorts with Ringo Starr's narration. Yeah. yeah. And then later on, uh, I think it was Alec Baldwin after George Carlin. Nice. Uh, it was one of the yeah. Baldwin brothers. Yeah, like when, when, when Thomas came on, it was usually two, the show two of the shorts in like the 20 minute slot or whatever it was. Um, the other one I really remember from primary school age, which is up to like 12, there was a show called Budgie the Little Helicopter and it was like all these... Little Helicopter? Budgie the Little Helicopter. Oh, Budgie. I thought you said Budget the Little Helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> He's only got like three out of the four propellers. Oh, <laughs> jeez. Like, <laughs> it was the same as Thomas. It was like anthropomorphized like these, these machines, but they were cartoon rather than like... So how about you, Huck? What did you watch as a kid? I mean, obviously Power Rangers. Yeah, I uh, watched Power Rangers. Um, I was... Pretty big. I grew up when uh, Fox Kids was a, was a really mm-hmm. big, heavy thing. So, Life with Louie, Ninja Turtles, um, the X Men, Spider Man cartoons, Eek the Cat, um, and then I moved to the States, watched a bit of the Nickelodeon stuff. Uh, so yeah, Doug. Uh, also, I think it was ABC too with like Recess, okay. um, Hey Arnold. You know, just those slew of Nickelodeon shows, Rugrats. Um, Animorphs when it was on because I was heavily into the books. Right. Um, yeah, that's the ones. Uh, there's probably a hell of a lot more, and I imagine after the show is done filming, I'm probably going to think of a, a ton. Like, more. like a ton because it's just going to flood back. It's just going to. And thankfully, I'm finding a lot of um, internet stations that are just rebroadcasting the old broadcasts. Um, you know, just like just one hundred percent streaming all the time. Um, hmm. It's kind of fun to to stumble across those ones. Uh, yeah, I can't think of too much. And then <laughs> I'd also watch after school Judge Judy, and oh <laughs> the, the People's Court. <laughs> See, our one was like that was um, my mom really liked the Ricky Lake show, and it was on yeah. at, like four thirty. Yeah, so like we get um, home, we get to watch our shows, and then she's like, yeah, off the TV, my turn now, and that we come yeah. on, we'd be like, what? 
Yeah, I'd get home and uh, my stepmom would be watching uh, daytime soap, so like General Hospital. Sonny, Sonny and his continuous plot lines. <laughs> um, the View, if I played hooky from school, they'd be The View. Um, Reaches and Kelly, you know, those shows. But those weren't really kids' shows, and that's not really what I watched a lot of. Um, but yeah, big into Power Rangers and any of those, like, those import shows as well. So, like, uh, I think VR Troopers was imported yeah. by Big Bad Beetleborgs. I think yeah. it was only the costumes were imported, but none of the... Well, I don't know. They might have had some of the fight scenes um, ported over. I think the only one that was uniquely North American was the uh, Mystic Knights of Tiernanog. I think that was the one that, oh they, that they took the Power Rangers idea of calling for magic armor and then just oh. tried their own thing with it. I made it probably, Irish for some reason. Well, because that's what you do when you have uh, King Finn Finn or something like that. The yeah, King of yeah. the fairies. No yeah. idea. Yeah. So it's it was definitely it was definitely uh, if young Hercules and and Xena and and the regular Kevin Sorbo Hercules if they could call for magic armor it was probably that oh kind of God. the love child of those two ideas. Oh man! So I'm uh, horrified. I, I'm telling you, like I, I should probably cut it there because I'm going to start remembering more and more <laughs> stuff. So, Jim, what did you end up uh, so watching as a kid? When I was a young kid, I did not have a TV mm-hmm. uh, for a and, long time. And now we all feel bad. No, no, no. Um, I absorbed TV vicariously through all the other children I knew. I remember distinctly my first grade teacher as I was like, because I was super into like Friday the Thirteenth and Hellraiser and. <laughs> shit like that and my and my, my, my first grade teacher sat down with my mom and was like your son watches too many movies <laughs> and my mom's like we do not have a television <laughs> where is he seeing these because that's impossible and it was but other people's parents let them watch those movies and I sort of sucked it all in but eventually we you know got a TV and before we had one I would always hang out at my friend Eric's place uh, his mom would babysit me on Saturday mornings when my mom was working at the newspaper. And we would watch all kinds of things. I don't remember a lot of it. I mean, obviously Ninja Turtles was hugely formative for me. It defines my love of pizza <laughs> and of kung fu. That's the same but, uh... <laughs> um, and, uh, wrestling. Oh, man. We were super into Hulk Hogan. <laughs> that was... That was like old school wrestling, like Hulk oh, Hogan, yeah. Ultimate Warrior, um, Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, the Macho Man, Randy Savage, like super old school stuff. You know, that was when Andre the Giant was still wrestling. Like I remember the first Royal Rumble. Uh, and then I proceeded to not care about it for years until I rediscovered it through a wrestling podcast. And now I listen to a wrestling podcast. <laughs> which we'll link in the show notes because it's really cool. Super good. But... <laughs> No, like, eventually I would go on and we would get YTV, which is, like, the Canadian kids channel. Mm-hmm. And they had, like, VJs. Because there was, there was Tarzan Dan and VJ Phil and all of whom I believe have gone on to have real careers. Mm-hmm. But all the shows I remember... Beast Wars. I never watched Beast Wars. Oh. No. Totally missed me. I'm older than you. That is true. Uh, no. Uh, Botsmaster. First show I ever saw that had a rap song at the beginning, and I was like, "Ooh!" And it's got fucking robots. <laughs> this is great. Uh, I remember import shows like uh, Sailor Moon, Samurai Pizza Cats, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But no, like a lot of it was like really weird stuff. I remember uh, things like Squawk Box, which is this like just really esoteric kids comedy show. It was it was sketch comedy with kids, mm-hmm. and the jokes were clearly aimed at children. Um, because grownups were just like, "What is this? <laughs> what is going on?" And kids are just like kids my of my age at the time were like this is the funniest shit. <laughs> it's it's interesting to me so far that nobody has mentioned The Simpsons. I remember the, the first few Simpsons episodes, and I remember liking The Simpsons for a while until I started hating it. 
Uh, I watched them uh, a little bit more as older. Actually, if anything, I watched uh, King of the Hill more than I watched The Simpsons growing Not up. Me. There was a there was a we used to have a challenge in high school, which was we could go when we got back to whichever friend's place. It was that you could turn the TV on at any time and find an episode of The Simpsons on. And that was that was the when when TV in, in Ontario started having fifty channels, mm-hmm. and so you could just any channel at some point would have The Simpsons, oh. and we watched like it was just it was just background noise. Back before there was a channel, um, I don't even know if it's if it's still around anymore. Now it, it used to be called Spike TV, which was like the men's channel. Um, mm-hmm. But it, before they did their programming uh, shift to Spike and then their own original programming, they had uh, TNN, I think it was what it was called, and that show was or that. Sh- program or uh, network showed a lot of Star Trek yep. and a lot of CSI and uh, yep. so I remember when CSI blew up and then it became sy- like kind of syndicated you could flip and it was you'd find either an episode of CSI and then much later on it was um, Criminal Minds yep. and you could pretty much just like cycle through the channels and find those two shows mm-hmm. and or Star Trek so for me that was glorious when I was watching all three of those shows it was amazing yeah I watched a ton of Star Trek as a kid uh, like back to the point where when I had like a dial television with an aerial, like, you'd watch Star Trek because or in, in Star Trek: The Next Generation specifically. Mm-hmm. But thinking of kids shows I watched, I didn't watch a lot, or at least that I remember. Like there's a lot of them in the background for my head, like Carmen San Diego and Ducktales and Ooh. Gummy Bears. Chip and Dale, yeah. By the time stuff started getting CG, so stuff like Beast Wars, which was done entirely in CG, um, Animorphs. Reboot. Uh, re- no, Reboot was was in my era. Hmm. But um, I also remember a show, and I'll, t- I'll try and dig it up. It was on YTV, and I remember I don't remember the name, but all they did it was just, it was just sort of several YTV VJs uh, which is short for video jockey. Arguably, we are now VJs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. But they just talked about shit that was cool. And I learned a bunch about like cutting-edge comic books that I could not afford to buy or read. So there's stuff like Bone and Gen 13. and like That was when Gen 13 was new. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, I just said, but, sorry. you know, Music and and things like that, and I was just like, it was just a show about like, like these reasonably hip twenty somethings being like, this is the shit we're into right now. Seems cool. And you were like, as a child, you know, I was like fifteen or something, being like, that does seem cool. You seem like cool people. I want to hang out. <laughs> Ted, you're gonna say something. Yeah, as a quick, you just solved a mystery that I've like, it's been for like 16, 17 years. How do I get so every cool? Now, no, every now and again, we'd have programs come on the TV, and before they started, it'd be like a blank screen and just a thing in the corner that said YTV, and I didn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> you were importing Canadian broadcasts. I just yeah. discovered why. That's amazing. That's, that's Mono one, Canada, they're right there. The only one I ever watched I knew definitely was Canadian was the adaption of the... Redwall books. I knew that was Canadian. Yeah. But I didn't know about... And yeah, like, you just mentioned, like, the stuff that you just talked about. I'm like, I saw that and had the YTV thing and my mind's just been blown. Yep, that's, that's, where, I, that's I, where I watched Bot, Bots Master. Occasionally, like, random channels have them on. I just... I, since I was little, I kept seeing this thing and wondering why this thing popped up and only some stuff and now that explains it. Yep. YTV is a Canadian wow. channel. Um, wow. It was interesting. Like, I, I didn't have anyone else. I'm an only child. Uh, I'm a single parent. My mom doesn't watch TV, like, ever. This has just never been a thing that she's been remotely interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never had to compete with anyone else for the TV. <laughs> I never had to fight with anybody over it. I just, like, TV is just a thing that I'd turn on and watch whatever I wanted. And, like, pretty... We were pretty early on. We were a house with two TVs because we'd picked up a bunch of old ones. Mm-hmm. So we were just getting broadcast TV... But I could have any TV that I wanted, mm-hmm. you know, sort of just on my TV. I used to watch golf. 
to help me get to sleep. I remember like the first Skybox. And Cartoon Network was channel thirty seven. I still remember that. I was 50. gonna I was gonna say, yeah, channel fifty we had uh, Cartoon Network. Um yeah. forty four was space, forty six was comedy. Forty seven TBS. Yeah. And fifty was comedy or it was cartoons. Yeah. Uh well and then there was the Cartoon Network proper out of the States. Um that, and that had like a lot of Hanna Barbera reruns. I never uh, had the, oh the man. fancy American show. So that, no, it, that wasn't me. That was my grandparents, and they had satellite C band. Mm. So I would I would watch that and uh, Reading Rainbow. Um, yeah, and then the Dexter's Laboratory and uh, yes. all, the, all the shows. So I said Johnny Bravo. Uh, and then I, we forgetting like the perennials of like Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball, and stuff like that. And yeah, I was just old enough. Or I was sorry. I was just too a Beyblade yet. I was just too old to get into like Pokemon, but I still got into Digimon and Yu Gi Oh and stuff because they appealed just to my my sensibility. So we are though we are starting to fall into. I told you, give me enough time, and I'm going to start coming <laughs> with stuff man, as well. Jesus. So let's move on to the final topic: games we played, and not just video games. We can talk about video games, so we can make a, that a whole separate podcast of the oh, old, yeah. old games that we played. But what else did we play? So Theo, you're from Scotland again. Yes. Um, you tell us uh, tell us of your strange foreign <laughs> footy cricket. Oh god, things I remember playing as a kid. Like I remember I was saying before, like um, I think I was about primary five, so about nine, eight, nine. Um, our school money came from somewhere, and for each year group, they bought like a basket of mm-hmm. different things, like skipping ropes, and those like pads with the velcro which for the ball back and forth, and all sorts of stuff. And yep. there was four classes in each year, and it rotate week by week which class got the basket of stuff. So it became a big, huge thing. It's like, oh my god, yes, we've got this cool stuff to play with. And we'd make up random little games with it. Like, <laughs> if you could chuck the ball and catch it so many times, it was a certain thing. and you, Or if somebody dropped it, they had a forfeit they had to do or whatever. And that was a whole thing. And then, like, the biggest thing at school was when it was nice weather. So sort of, like, May, June. We occasionally got nice weather in Scotland. Um, <laughs> if it was a nice... <laughs> If it was a nice afternoon, and like the teacher was like, "Okay, if he's done our work for today, or we can go out and play rounders," and rounders is basically a simplified version of baseball. It's there would be people with jumpers as bases, and you have two teams. One team would be batting, one team would be fielding, and it was like a a fo- like a plastic bat and a, like a little tennis ball, and you basically you had to play. You you hit it as far as you could and try and run as far around the bases as you can, and. At that sort of time, like my dad occasionally played cricket for local clubs, so my sister and I had learned how to play cricket because mm. osmosis or something, I don't know. <laughs> but it turned out I was really good at hitting the ball just far enough that I could get it away from the fielders, but it wasn't like out of bounds, like in the, the janitor's garden or something. And um, even though I was like, I was always bigger built, like I was one of the taller people in my year, um, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and I was always quite awkward about it, but this is one game I was quite good at. On occasion, I could get home runs and stuff, so it was quite a good. I enjoyed that. And then, like when we went to my grand's, uh, my grand lives in a place called Gags Hill, just outside Edinburgh. It's a tiny little place, and um, there's two games we used to play there. One we were allowed to play, and one we weren't. Um, the one we were allowed to play was Kirby, which was a person would stand on the other side of the street, and you'd have like a it was like a, a soccer ball, football, and you had to bounce off the other person's curb and then catch it near again. And you got one point, you bounced off the curb, five points if you caught it. And then if you missed it, it was like the other person's turn. Mm-hmm. So we used to play that until a car came and you had to like, get away the cars. Um, and the other one we played weren't supposed to was um, Chappie Door Run. Which is basically you ran Chappie Door Run. You would go to the neighbor's house and knock on the door and then leg it so before they answered the door. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Nick, we call it, I think, what, uh, Nicky Nicky Nine Doors? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, we weren't supposed to do that, but we did it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that's why. I like, and then like when we moved to our new street here, because it's a bit of a quieter street. It's only five houses, so we used to play football, like soccer, out in the street quite a bit. Very sort of not at all strict way of playing it. Like if it bounced off the wall, sometimes yeah. it was out, sometimes it wasn't, and it was just casual sort of, rules enforcement. Yeah, yeah, it was very much very trampolic. chill. It's good fun. Yeah, no. Way. So we we don't really have street soccer in Canada, or street footy, or whatever you would refer to it as. Yeah. Uh, but I do come from a long-standing Canadian tradition of kids growing up playing road hockey, where you make a net out of whatever you got, you get sticks out of whatever you got. Some t- some kids have real hockey sticks, some kids don't. You use like a book bag and uh, your hat 
to play goalie. Mm-hmm. You really hope you don't catch a slap shot on your thumb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you just sort of go. I was saying with neighborhood baseball, we never had enough money for real baseball, so we used tennis ball. Mm-hmm. Um, or real bats. So mm-hmm. do whatever you can. We, I think we, I have one bat. And we had like four bats in the whole neighborhood. Mm-hmm. The day that somebody got a glove was a revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and you, or you'd get a glove that that fit because you'd get a glove from like your older brother, mm-hmm. um, or your dad, or something, and that was most of the kids I knew. That's what they had, but it doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. You got to grow into it, and even then, baseball glove fit is really tricky. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as a person who has no brothers and no father, I didn't really have a place until I inherited a glove from another kid. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, that was the 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 game that I always played in gym class. The game that in in, in which I shone was uh, King's Court, which is like an evolved form of dodgeball. Uh, I am very large on this podcast. I appear to be larger than Huck, but I am not. I slouch. He slouches. He's actually like four inches taller than me. <laughs> but I'm I'm quite large, and I have always been one of the bigger kids in class. And I have this the the virtue I guess um, of being large and somewhat graceful and I can keep my feet juggling at a very early age probably helps with that a whole bunch but the result is that somehow the biggest kid in class me would dominate King's Court like all you have to do is keep your feet not get hit by stuff throw balls Mm -hmm. These are things that I am pretty good at. Um, and so it would be really funny. Like, the last, last people standing, you'd always have, you know, the super athletic kid in your class. Because you always had one of those. Mm-hmm. And, like, they were just, they were they were super athletic. They were super competitive. And they were not going to lose this game no matter what. Um, mm-hmm. so even, if you're, and even if your side is losing, that, that person remains. Um, the next person is the super bendy kid. <laughs> the kid who's just, like, is a human elastic band. And so... Their movements are sufficiently unpredictable that they're impossible to anticipate. <laughs> and then, me. No one has any fucking idea how I got there. But I am. I spend enough time avoiding people that I am impossible to touch. And no, it was it was it was a good time. Like like as a kid who did not often shine in physical activities at school, it was good to have that moment once in a while. <laughs> And now the game we weren't allowed to play. You, you, you brought up Kirby before, and we didn't really know about it. It's not a culturally a Canadian thing. Um, but Ryan, did you ever play Red Ass in school? Yep, we called it Red Butt. We weren't allowed to swear. Yeah, so. We weren't allowed to swear either. Yeah. We called it Red Ass. Yeah, we played that. But you know, it was where you you would throw it. You would throw a tennis ball at a wall, and like the rules are, I think, are very vague. Yeah. But you had to throw a tennis ball at a wall, and catch it. Either in your hat or in your hand, mm-hmm. before it bounced on the ground or before it got more than one bounce. Mm-hmm. And if you if it bounced and then you caught it, you got a strike against you. Uh, and if you just caught it, then it would clear all your strikes or something like that. And if you had enough strikes, I think it was four or three, something like that. Um, you were the red ass. See, and, we called that donkey, but we played yeah, it you, but, differently. And you would have to, you would have to stand against the wall while everybody who was playing threw the tennis ball at your ass. Oh no, we didn't do that. That's horrible. Yeah, that was that was why it was called yeah. red ass. I think in our our version of the rules, it was um, you threw the ball, and if you if you tried to catch it and you fumbled it, you had to run and touch the wall before yes. somebody else yes. covered the ball and threw it. So they weren't hitting you. It was you had to run and touch the wall before the other person threw the ball and it bounced off the wall. Yeah, but it, but it would always be... You'd always get that kid who would aim for your hand. Yeah. So you'd, you're reaching up to touch the wall and this, this tennis ball just slams into your metacarpals. Yeah. And you're like, oh, this is this is what pain feels like, and this is why you weren't allowed to play that game. Yeah. So, I, and I think it was four strikes for B U T T. Yeah. For us, so. Or yeah. like, us, yeah. it was we, we, British Bulldog. Yeah. Oh god. Which was so super banned. 
yep. in Canadian <laughs> schools that I do oh, not even schools. know how to play it. All I know is that it exists and that it was super unbelievably banned. We were allowed to play it when we were primary seven and we were allowed down on the grass at playtime. Because, like, when my school sits, it sits on top of a hill and all around the school is, like, concrete playgrounds. Mm-hmm. Ah. Super banned playing it on there. Because I think, I remember primary five, I think four people broke their arm, one person broke his leg, someone sconed their head off the railings. Yeah. It's not like a matter of like two weeks. This game Ooh. was super banned. Um, when we played down in the grass, it was two trees were far enough apart they could be the lines either side, and you had the line in the middle of people who were trying to catch you. So we're always playing the grass because like, it's a bit like a rugby tackle on the grass and it wasn't so like yeah. going to kill you. But yeah, no, it was super banned at our school. No, I, I I remember all the playground games. I remember like it was never institutional or anything like that. Like it, it was always weird shit. Like it was playing pretend or things like that. But the one I distinctly remember was one year. I was in like the third grade. Yeah, it would have been the third grade, and we got a new portable at school. Mm-hmm. And behind that portable was a sand pit. It wasn't very big. It was like five feet across. And like September, five dudes in like the four, like grade three through grade five were like, we're starting a motherfucking sumo league. (laughs) And for like three weeks solid. We had a sumo league. Oh my god, that's amazing. Like you would get in the sand pit with somebody else and it wasn't like it wasn't violent in in that sense. It was but but it was like you had to grip them and move them and get them out of the sand pit. Mm-hmm. Um there were kids that did commentary. <laughs> like, oh my god. That was that was where I got my start. Was talking shit during the sumo league. <laughs> oh, that's so cool! <laughs> Dang, I wish we had sand for our school. Actually, no, there's like seven hundred kids at our school would wreck it. Yeah, no, two, two, two of my friends, um, Jose and uh, Navaz, were like super big into sumo. Um, which was really, and, and it was, it was interesting because like most of the the, the like the bigger kids. And like the bully kids were strictly barred from playing. Mm. Yeah. Like if if schoolyard bullies came around, sumo just dispersed. <laughs> it was like, no, you're unwelcome here. Yeah. This is not for you. <laughs> huh, games you played. Yeah, I'll try to make it really quick. Uh, so we played a lot of those games. Uh, we also played um, I think we called it 500, uh, the one where one person would get the ball and everybody else would gather on the other side of the field and you'd throw pop flies and call out, uh, like, 100, and whoever caught it would get that many points and whoever got to 500 first would trade spots with that person. Uh, What else did we play? Uh, Horse. We play horse. with the never ba- played horse. Uh, with basketball, just you yep. call shots and uh, the next person that misses it gets a letter. Yeah. Um, we played tetherball. Uh, which we didn't have any of those in the states, but we didn't have recess in the states, so it was a little different. But tether ball is just a, a pole that has a, a rope or a chain attached to it. And then you get the ball and you attach it to the rope, and then the idea was two people would try to wrap the tether ball around the post by just striking the ball. So then there'd be rules like you weren't allowed to cross the line or you weren't allowed to touch the rope. You had to only hit the ball and. You know, sometimes you were allowed to, like, do setups, but, you know... So yeah, it, it, none of my schools... Yeah. I went to a bunch of schools as a kid, and none of them were trusted with a tetherball. Yeah. We barely were trusted with a seesaw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, what else? I guess uh, the big the big one that we played was a variation on your um, King's Court, but it was Medic. Uh, so this was like Dodgeball, uh, but instead of the King's Court, which I believe, like, in your... In King's Court, if you get out, you're allowed to go to the other side yeah. and to their back line. Yeah, and if you retrieve a ball, like if a ball makes it to you, you can throw that ball from the back line. Yeah, and were you allowed back into the game? Yeah, okay. that got you back in. So this one is a variation on that idea, except when you are 
when you get out, when you get hit, you just sit down where you get hit. You're not allowed to go to the other side. And in that space at the back of either team is a free space where they had a medic. And it was one person, and we only played medic where uh, you had, it's like um, a little rolly board. The board's maybe a foot by a foot, plastic, and it had uh, wheelie wheelies on the bottom. And so that person would be safe in the zone, but any time a person was out, they had to run out to the person, get them to sit on the the wheelie platform, and then they had to pull them back to the safe zone, and that would rescue them, and then they would go out and play again. So the, the idea is you get people out, and then when the medic comes out, you try to hit the medic, because once the medic's out, that's it. You, you're not allowed to refresh your team, mm-hmm. and you just go until you, you eliminate the other team. So that was, uh, that was the version of dodgeball that we often enjoyed playing. Um, but if your school didn't have those little wheelie... Uh, small s- boards, then yeah. I'm you- pretty sure those boards are just mounts for cha- for wheeling chairs around. Uh, yeah, for they're smaller than those. Oh, okay, before. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, these ones were dedicated. Like you were uh, like allowed to sit on it. Like it was meant for like a tiny little child ass hmm. that you could push each other around on these wheelie things. I have no idea. Think of a skateboard cut in half and it's about a foot by a foot. Uh, but the wheels went in any direction. Like it's not like a skateboard; they're fixed wheels. So. Uh, so those were some of the games we played, and I imagine I could come up again with a list of more games that we played, uh, but we are, this has been a long episode, we should yep. probably <laughs> start to wind it down a bit. Oh man, Theo, where can we find you online? Um, Twitter usually, at Captain Wardbeard. It's probably the best place to find me. Mm-hmm. Alright. Hawk, how about you? Um, RJ Huckle, you can find me on the Twitters, um, or Huckle on Instagram, or just... Drop me a line in the, the comment section down below, and uh, and you can definitely hit me up there. Yes, leave your comments with your favorite childhood games. Um, we may even attempt to play some in a future video. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And oh, it's so good you guys to play rounders when you come here. Scotland, oh British Bulldog. <laughs> no. Hey, I'm an expert. We're, we have old people British knees Bulldog now. We don't play I'll British see. Bulldog. We have old people knees now. Yeah. I like my knees. I need them. <laughs> <laughs> there would hold up all my stuff. Oh dear. Uh, no, you can find me on Twitter at, on, at Concept Crucible on, and at jimtinkle.com or as Hawk mentioned in the comments below regardless of where you are unless you're listening on iTunes in which case you can find us uh, at conceptcrucible.com mm-hmm. and comment. We will see you later. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Theo. We're signing off. Stay Awesome. We're dancing, by the way. You can't see us.